Sorry. <laughs> also, I need. I feel like I need to send you like a a streaming um, uh, kit, right? Like, uh, you need the lights. You need the. You know, I mean, your headsets are okay, I guess. You don't have noise cancellation, but in general, I think I think you're doing okay. We just need the the streaming kit. You need one of these, Wardy. Do you have one of these? <laughs> no, I don't stream enough for that. I don't, to be honest, though, I do sit here and um, I've got spotlights right above my head. Mm-hmm. Uh, actually. Oh, there you go. I like that a lot. You yeah. sit here in the dark. That's what it is. Yeah, that's. And, and by the way, I do like to stay in the dark as well until I start streaming. Then yeah, we're we're pretty much the same school, old school kind of, you know, uh, keep it dark and just stay focused. It's gonna destroy our eyes at some point in time. <laughs> hey, you know, you know what I also discovered recently? There's this pair of goggles, glasses called X Real, right? I've been trying them for a while. You put them oh, on. Yeah, Are they the AR ones? Yeah, they're pretty yeah. good. I like them a lot. I, I was like really disappointed to hear that Microsoft has uh, stopped with the HoloLens stuff. I, I thought that had some serious potential. It just needed a, a decent software stack, and they could have done wonders with it. Like, yep. Do you know what happened with that? Like, What was the reasoning behind it? Just, just business decisions. <laughs> it's big companies, man. I'll never understand why they did, why they decide to do anything. Ultimately, it's always money. But it's like you see something really good out there, and you think, "I'll give that time to sort of gestate," because I think that's going to become something, and then it just disappears. And you're like, "What the?" <laughs> I mean, I, remember, I, I thought Google goggles, the the Google glasses were yeah. a great product and then it got shut down the one thing that microsoft broke my heart on was uh the surface book and then now they're bringing it back so i thought that was i was happy to hear that yeah 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 they do some really good like slimline lightweight stuff that's just crazy powerful right like the, the wizardry that they've got going on in those things it, it's crazy man you, you gotta compete you gotta build a world-class thing right yeah, so yeah. Th- but nobody but, nobody could hold a candle to nintendo when it comes to these things just the level of innovation <laughs> you know um yeah. they do have a habit of coming out with like really quirky things that you thought oh, i never thought of that but that's a really cool idea isn't it yeah yeah <laughs> Okay, so so I'm really happy to see you. Happy to talk to you again. Um, you know, tell me a little bit what happened with the cul-de-sac, and how did you take that to the next level? Yeah, so I guess we should pick up from where we left off in our previous, our big yep. five-hour session, which I'm sure you'll link to when you upload this to yep. YouTube. Yeah. So yep. to recap, basically, for anyone who picks this one up and hasn't seen it. Um, I've been working for a company for about eight years now, um, and I inherited a supply chain finance product that deals with funding transactions. Um, It's what we call reverse factoring. Um, Factoring is the process of um, effectively selling an invoice, is what it Mm -hmm. boils down to, to a funder at a small cost in order Mm -hmm. to get paid earlier. And it's a problem that tends to be uniquely relevant if you like to the biggest companies around because they're oddly the worst at paying for some reason they the business processes are so elongated and can often take months to get any money out of them so Mm -hmm. this kind of process helps sort of automatically i guess by contract speed everything up Um, Mm -hmm. so what happened was I went through sort of six iterations, kept hitting various walls, hitting various problems with it. Um, and I think I ended up one day, I, you know, popped into your Discord and ended up chatting with you about the sorts of problems I was having. And uh, you said, well, try this this standard thing out that everybody's talking about around me for some reason. <laughs> <laughs> so I was like, okay, let's, let's give it a whirl, right? <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, the, the bottom line is that um, I don't want to talk too much about sort of the standard directly because I, I feel like you do that piece. It, it's kind of, I think it's probably best that we focus on kind of what my experience with it yeah. is. Yeah, yeah, this is this is, yeah, this this is where I learned the most. I mean, 
again, just just for the people watching, if you haven't you haven't seen Paul Wardy, I know we have we've had like almost six or seven thousand people since last time Wardy streamed with us. <laughs> but you know, on our subscription, we're almost up to thirteen thousand people, which is really amazing, uh, considering how niche the topics that we discuss are. Like we're not out there telling people how to build a calculator or how to learn Java in 10 minutes or any of that stuff. You know, there are people that pretty much covering that part. We're doing the boring stuff, the long term uh, enterprise. By the way, one one of the folks, I read this the other day, like the reason why not you won't find a lot of streamers and a lot of people put enterprise architecture or talk about enterprise is because one, it takes a long time Right, and we are now in this day and age where people's attention span is like 10 seconds. So they're not able to focus. Yeah. But also, <laughs> but also more importantly, the, the <laughs> literally just, oh yeah, this, a new thing, right? <laughs> what, what were we talking about? So, okay. So <laughs> the, the other thing is Maybe about enterprise art, right. <laughs> An enterprise architecture is not like mainstream. Like you're not like how many, like if there are, if there are 20 million engineers around the world, how many of these really are working on a true enterprise application? So it becomes even a more niche topic, like more and more niche topic. You know, it becomes more and more interesting the, 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 the further you go, you know, so that's why when I when I say thirteen thousand, that's like the equivalent of one hundred and thirty thousand. If it comes to some of these places where people do pranks or drop an iPhone from a twenty-story building or anything like that, I think I think it's quite amazing. The more amazing part about this is that people who are not exposed necessarily to enterprise architecture, and they get to actually you know uh, be exposed to that. They don't have that opportunity in their day-to-day -day work. Right. They don't work with hundreds of millions of records like you're doing. You know, they don't work with massive, you know, architecture that has been there for 20, 30, 40 years like I'm doing. So it, it comes to it comes really down to that. So, OK, so just keeping that in mind, just tell me a little bit about what how far did you go with the standard cul-de-sac specifically from your own personal experience? Tell me what happened. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got, um, in my solution, I've got somewhere in the region of about 100 ODATA endpoints, 100, 150, somewhere in that region. I haven't mm -hmm. counted them in a while. It's been a long time. But mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, each one of those endpoints effectively offers full CRUD functionality to um, some particular set of data. Um, mm -hmm. the way that they're kind of managed is with Microsoft's existing ODATA framework, which is, mm -hmm. you know, Microsoft out of the box. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a tricky proposition to, to deal with. Um, so what I found is that if you put behind each controller, if you can imagine there is a, an orchestration service, so I'm talking hundred plus orchestration services. And those orchestration services ultimately then have effectively their cul-de-sac pieces behind them. Um, what I found is that there are a few that are so complex and so interconnected with other things that my biggest problem was essentially drawing the problem. <laughs> um, because if you can... If you can you visualize it. it. Yeah. Yeah. If you can visualize it, you can often solve it because you'll point at a part of a picture that doesn't look right and you'll go, why? What, mm -hmm. Why mm -hmm. don't I just do this instead? You know, and you'll move things around. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, the way that the, the standard is documented, credit to you, you know, it's, it's really good. Um, what I was finding was that I was having critical points that i just didn't understand aspects of it or i would understand it but I, I wasn't really getting it or consuming it the way you do so i would watch you on a live stream for god knows how many hours you know doing a series on something and then i'd be like yeah okay i, th I think i've got this right and then i'd sit down to do it and then i'd realize i'm a terrible programmer that 
That is basically what it boils down to. I am a terrible programmer. I I love to use DDD. I think it's a great idea, but in practice, I am so lazy. I will get straight into that code, sob the test, everything's gonna go to crap. And, that's you know, that's why that's why a lot of people don't see the connection between pair programming and test driven development. But it really is like you're gonna get bored and you're gonna get lazy, and in your head be like, why in the heck do I need to write you know twenty lines of code when I could just call the broker and call it, right? I I know I know the kind of pressure that you know an engineer might be under, especially when they're working on their own. Even if they're given all the time and resources in the world, I can see it, it takes a lot more than just knowing. You know, it takes believing and and a lot of other things like that. But but just tell me, the one thing I really <laughs> just to understand, Paul, and and I was explaining this to people the other day. I said the standard community has three types of people, right? There are doers, people that will just pick up the stand, go implement it, right? These are like the Kailus of the world, right? These are the people that will just go in and be like just let's just get it done right and then there are uh thinkers you know like yourself you basically come in and be like why are we doing it this way and you are more valuable than you can imagine because if it wasn't for your questions you're basically the donald knuth and i don't know if you know donald knuth but he's a terrible programmer if donald knuth writes code oh god help us all it's going to be trash i know that not that that your code is trash or anything like that you know uh but if Donald Knuth is solving an algorithmic problem or trying to come up with a solution from an architecture standpoint, you want to listen to this guy. This guy wrote an entire series, not one book or two, an entire series, about five or six of them. Uh, that's called The Art, The Art of Software uh, Engineering or something like that. Um, highly recommend, you know, if you want to wreck your brain and not understand anything two hours later reading into a book, Donald Knuth. And then there's the third, the third type of people, which are leaders. You know, these are, and you also have this, like, it's, it's crazy how you can just kind of bounce in between, you know, being a philosopher in the standard, you're coming up with philosophies and ideas, but also the leadership part where you're inviting people in, advocating, going out there, talking to people, you know, telling them, here's why we're doing this and all that. You're actually trying things yourself. Don't sell yourself short. You're very, very valuable to our community, you know, and, we don't have to talk every day to make sure that this is the case, but you know, uh, just going throughout all the stuff that I, I I don't know if you saw how we upgraded the standard in exception handling and stuff like that. You know, we continue to evolve. We're always evolving and changing. <sighs> going back to this, okay. So you're scaling, right? You're scaling things. By the way, the thing that you just said is worth to be written in gold. If you can't draw a picture of the problem that you're trying to solve, how can you, and on God's green earth, how possibly can you just go in and write code? Because I know a lot of people just go like this, right? They go just straight to this, right? I draw I always, more than I write code. <laughs> I, I always think of, um, I think it was Einstein originally, uh -huh. the, the quote goes something like, if you can't um, explain it to an idiot, then you, you don't obviously understand don't it. understand it, yeah. yeah. <laughs> And, you know, it's one of the big things that he struggled with because obviously he was so far ahead of his time that, you know, 100 years later, we're still figuring out the stuff that he knew. And, like, this is the problem that I have within the standard. And sometimes it's like you and me will come to different, you know, positions on something. And it's simply because, you know, I'm looking at a particular problem that I have mm -hmm. and I've come up with a different way of solving it. And your immediate reaction is, well, is it standard nope. compliant? And I'm like, <laughs> Yeah, um, maybe not. <laughs> so, yeah, I've, I've got a few things that um, areas, shall we say, where I've gone uh, above and beyond. So, you know, to, to answer your initial question, of like how far have I taken cul-de-sac? Um, I've implemented it. I've then gone, ah, I've got an issue, as, as you've noticed. Um, so one issue that I had was eventing. So I, I pulled that apart and, and rebuilt that in a different way. Another issue that I had was around security. Um, and, and you'll notice a common pattern with this stuff. Um, another issue with this was um, when, God knows what's going on in the background. Um, I need to get you a, a noise canceling pair of headsets. <laughs> that, that needs to happen. But other than that, yeah. it's not too bad. Go ahead, keep going. 
apologies. <laughs> Kids, it's what are you going to do? Right? <laughs> yeah, we're quite <laughs> down around seven o'clock, and we're what half an hour away. So, um, so where was I? Yeah. So the common theme is it's it's all the issues that that like you've kind of cottoned on to that nobody ever talks about. You know, if you mention the word enterprise architecture. No one talks about it. Yep. There's, there's a few thousand of us in the world you yep, know, that are truly. running around doing all this this big scale stuff. Yep. You, know, you can speak to the guys at I don't know Netflix and like they're dealing with something truly insane. But like you try and find another guy that's doing similar. You know, it, you're talking market leading companies like Microsoft, Amazon, Apple. Unless yep. you're working for these big guys, you don't typically face you don't get these the chance. That's right. That's right. So. What I found is that, um, yeah, eventing, security, and uh, the, the third one is that concept of freeing yourself from the limits of a request life cycle. And this is a, a crucially important concept because there are so many things that we do in our business operations day to day that we feel the need that we have to process the entire, apologies, uh, yeah, we have to process the entire thing as part mm -hmm. of, I don't know, the limited, let's say it's a minute before mm -hmm. a request times out. And quite mm -hmm. often you'll find that your business rules can be so complicated that it's just not possible. Mm -hmm. and, and so you have to start finding ways around that problem. Uh, so what I started off doing was I was realizing that um, in my case... Well, I can actually show you. To be yeah. Uh, have a look. Share screen. Uh, yeah, here we go. Okay. I will. Wow! Look at that. Yeah. Wow. So uh -huh. this this is where I kind of started. Um, effectively, what I've got here is I've got different types of transactions. I've got credits, I've got invoices, uh, I've got purchase orders, I've got offer information, and I've got payments, also known as um, remittance advices. And then we've got this concept of something called a flattened uh, transaction, which we, re mm -hmm. we refer to as an active transaction, mm -hmm. which is basically mm -hmm. kind of um, the flattened header only information from the others in a sort of working set so that we mm -hmm. can work with them for performance reasons. Mm -hmm. um, so what I was finding was that, um, say, uh, for example, um, payment is introduced mm -hmm. somewhere. So a remittance advice is added. If you think about what a remittance advice is um, in the real world, a remittance advice is effectively a transaction document that represents um, Think of it much like an invoice, but the mm -hmm. line items are each invoices. So a remittance advice really is a batch payment, essentially. So you have, you know, buyer account, supplier account. There's a payment that goes into the supplier account from the yep. buyer's account for yep. a batch of invoices. So what typically happens is um, these, again, big companies, they pay stuff in huge payment runs. So what will happen is you'll get nothing for say a ten days worth of work, and then a whole, and then, and then a whole, you get a whole stack of them. Yeah, and if you deal with that company at scale, which is probably the case if you're dealing with a Fortune 500 company, you'll find that there could be hundreds, possibly even thousands of invoices um, connected to a single remittance advice. So what you then end up with is this kind of hierarchy of structure um, between document <sighs> types. So. The way to look at it is if an invoice is a header with a collection of line items, then a remittance advice is a batch header with a collection of header items as line items. Um, so then you can see this, this hierarchy. Now, my problem gets even more complicated where um, collections of invoices and credit notes can be pulled together into another kind of batch item, which we refer to as an offer. Mm -hmm. which a, a finance entity can buy that collection essentially and offer to pay the supplier early for them. This is part of the, the factoring process that I was mm -hmm. talking about. Mm -hmm. um, and then when payments come in, they could pay the original transactions or they could pay the offer. And what gets paid and when 
is kind of complicated. So if you think about what that means in terms of states, okay, mm -hmm. if I have, say, for example, a funding state on an invoice and I generate an offer, the knock-on effect is that I need to update the invoices related to it. But this is done at the line level. Yeah. So you start to see where these kind of batch operations start to interact with one another. And then in my case, to make things even worse, is every one of our clients doesn't just send us one transaction request at a time. What they tend to send us is blobs of CSV data daily overnight. So what I was finding was for our biggest clients, I would end up in a scenario where they would send us a blob of CSV data. And what would essentially happen is we would um, figure out how to kind of parse and, tr and transform that into our format. You Paul, before one... this, there's no guarantee that this CSV is valid, right? Yeah, of course. There's a whole ton of valid. I'm talking best case at the moment without any of the complications <laughs> involved. We'll, uh -huh. we'll come back to all the complication later. Yes, I have faced that problem. <laughs> Um, so effectively, what I was finding was, uh, and this is this is I've deliberately pulled up this diagram because this was kind of like the first model that I designed that was standard compliant. And the yeah. whole idea behind it was that I could receive transactions from any one of these sets. And what would essentially happen is the events would propagate up to this transaction management service, uh -huh. which was kind of like um, a sort of God object. that lived Yeah, at the top it's an aggregator it would, of, ag yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's an orchestrator of down. orchestrators. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, but what I was finding was the, the act of actually coding that particular class turned into be um, an absolute pain in the ass, frankly. Okay. Tell me why. Um, now, <laughs> it came down to responsibilities and, uh -huh. Um, what I was running into was this um, contract cleanliness problem. Um, so there's a rule in the standard, as mm -hmm. you and I both know, yep. but for the community's benefit, there's a rule that basically says, hey, keep your contracts clean. Yep. Okay. So what happens is um, if we think about it in terms of entities, if mm -hmm. I have an invoice orchestration service mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and imagine that my invoice orchestration service is exposing uh, CRUD functionality for invoices, um, then alongside that, I've got a credit orchestration service, right. rinse, repeat for credits. So yep. now I've got two entity types and I want to yep. aggregate them. So what do I do? I aggregate them into a One model, transaction yeah. coordination service. Yeah. Um, now, that transaction coordination service now needs to do some mapping to expose one single model that represents either an invoice or a transaction or a yeah. container that can contain a collection or a single one of either. Yeah. So what I was finding was that by doing this aggregated method up and down the chain like this, I was doing a lot of extra tran um, transformational mapping. work transformation, and yeah. mapping yeah, mm -hmm. in my stack. And it just ended up just adding so much overhead. Um, so I thought, well, what's the point, right? Don't mm -hmm. do that. Uh -huh. um, so I started to come to the conclusion that actually what I wanted was something um, a bit flatter in nature. So what I, I came up with was something like this, where I have um, my, my standard blocks of transaction elements. Um, and then what would happen is I would raise the relevant events and they would go off and it, and the scaling would then be done horizontally. So uh -huh, uh -huh. instead of kind of working vertically back up, um, when the events got raised, the other services could then handle them. But what I was finding is because of the interconnected nature between my transaction types, when I started doing this, I was finding that, for example, um, if a new payment was added, it could potentially affect an invoice. Um, but if the invoice had a credit note attached to it already, then it would affect the credit note as well, because I was clearing mm -hmm. both, right? Yep. So now I've got this scenario where under the standard, the way that it's documented, um, I'm implementing a, a payment scenario, essentially. So I go to my payment orchestration service, and I need to handle um, uh, sorry, I go to my 
invoice orchestration service and I need to handle payment events, but I also need to handle offer events mm. and I potentially need to handle credit events, which means I now need event processing services from each of those. So mm. now what I have to do is I have to build effectively orchestration services on top of those to aggregate them into one thing. Mm -hmm. But then I've got an orchestration service now that needs to depend on an orchestration service. And I was like, okay, that isn't going to work. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't aggregate my events. I was finding that vertically stacking was wasting resource, essentially, processing-wise. Mm -hmm. um, so architecturally, I was missing something. What was it? Mm -hmm. So what I did was I figured out that eventing needed a bit of an overhaul. Okay. Um, so effectively, instead of um, thinking of these things as monoliths, which was kind of like the attitude that I was sort of taking with these things, mm -hmm. um, think of them more like traditional microservices, but internally within. So when we think of microservices, we think more of like an endpoint that we're exposing and the whole stack behind it. Right, them. right. So I was thinking of cul-de-sacs as kind of like mini microservices within my code. Okay. okay. By taking that approach with it, I can then say, okay, I've got a microservice and it wants to do something, um, but it also wants to notify other microservices that it's going to do that. So obviously I have eventing, I have event hubs, and there are some scenarios where I want to do that internally, and there are some scenarios where I want to do that externally. Externally, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And when you do these things uh, internally, what you tend to find is you hit that um, timing wall, essentially, where everything has to happen inside the, the HTTP request because of the nature of how we're awaiting all of the tasks in the chain. But if you farm the workload off to Service Bus, then not only can you do the workload asynchronously and out of the HTTP request, you can completely take it out of process. So what that means is you can farm the workload off to a completely different application um, but not only that, because you're essentially putting a message onto service bus, you can have n number of subscribers that can handle that. And it, that got me thinking, well, do I want n number of subscribers or do I want to handle that problem myself? Because mm -hmm. the reason why I sort of started thinking about that was I was thinking, well, when I'm developing locally, I don't have a service bus instance to hand, right? What I want to do is I want to spin up a process. I want to make a HTTP call, and I want to handle the whole thing end to end so I can step through it all. Yeah. So from a debugging point of view, it makes sense for me to be able to just switch, flick a switch and, and switch between, say, do everything locally and do everything distributed. Externally. Yeah. 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 So this I like. I like where you're going with this because you're controlling, oh, God, you're controlling beyond than just the entity and the logic for that entity but how oh man you're controlling the scalability of the problem solving okay keep going i'm listening okay so imagine an initial implementation of the distributed version might be i raise an event in an event processing service somewhere it goes down into a broker and then the broker just calls say an azure function because Azure functions are infinitely scalable. Yeah, yeah, okay. of course. Mm -hmm. Okay, but you want to manage that. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? Between the Azure function call and the, the broker, you put service bus, because then that allows you to fine tune it. Because with service bus, you can specify how many parallel executions come off the queue at a given yep. point in time. Yep. So that allows you to control your scalability, essentially. So you get the best of both worlds. You get the scalability, but you also get control of it. Yeah. Okay. So there's a lot of um, stuff that you will kind of like, you don't think about until you hit it. I yeah, I know. I know. So like initially I thought, well, I don't need service bus, right? So what did I do? I spun it all up. I sent a massive batch of data at the endpoint. It called the Azure function 10,000 times. The database went, nah, mate, not having that. So <laughs> I went, ah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> you just floored it. Just DDoSed yourself. Yeah. You're not you're not a real engineer until you DDoS yourself. <laughs> yeah. So 
obvious conclusion, right? Um, and and this, um, this was an interesting thing because from my original architecture that I had before the standard to where I am now, I did the classic what a senior engineer does, which is, okay, I got some big blob of data. Some of it might be in the database, some of it might not. So the first thing I do is parse my big blob of data and then I go and get all the stuff that's in the database, mm-hmm. that, um, or I, I iterate over my blob of data is iteration what is you know version one of this. Whilst iterating, I pull the, the item from the database, and you know if it doesn't exist, I add the new one. If it does exist, I update the one that's there. Right? Yeah. Um, of course, doing that, lots of databases, course, so you get the OM problem. Okay. So then the next step up from that is okay, I parse everything, I get everything from the database, I do it all in memory, one big transaction, EF save changes, I end up with a gigabyte long transaction, SQL mm-hmm. Server cries. So this was where I was when we met. I had a crying SQL server like you know most people um i was processing things largely in line um i was using things like um, background services and tasks in asp net so my api was doing massive chunks of data yep. Yep. in the background whilst api new api calls were coming in i'm wondering why my web pages are loading slow and i'm like oh this is ridiculous <laughs> uh-huh. so <laughs> So when we talk about service bus and Azure functions, we're talking about doing the same workload, but just putting it somewhere else. Yeah. Now, the critical thing when you start doing this is that what you then end up with is you've got multiple applications. So now people logically, um, seniors in my experience, um, juniors mostly, but seniors also make this mistake where mm-hmm. what they do is they say, okay, I've got application one with its own stack and code base. I've got application two with its own stack and code base right and i'll separate the two and you know all all things are good right but think about my scenario where sometimes i want to work locally and sometimes i want to work in the cloud Mm -hmm. um what i wanted to be able to do is Mm -hmm. i wanted to be able to write a library Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and then um i wanted to be able to say okay how how i choose to package that library is a separate concern from the library itself. So right. think about it like: imagine you've got a a cul-de-sac that's mm-hmm. a, you know portion of your library, and mm-hmm. what I want to do is I want to compile that into uh, a DLL file, and then I'll, I'm going to say, okay, um, depending on either app configuration or just two different apps, I'll depend on that library. And therefore, those apps can behave completely differently. I can use config files or I can use I can write completely different code. But at the application level, and we're talking like ASP.NET, you know, console apps, whatever it is we want to write as your functions apps, all I need to do is I need to make um, an API call into my library. So I've got maybe five lines of code in the app to initialize everything. You know, it's just, hey, you know, build a dot services dot add my library. <laughs> kind of calls, um, maybe give it some parameters or something. Um, but the bottom line here is that by packaging it up in that way, um, what mm-hmm. I wrap around it is a, is a different concern to the library itself. So what I had, what I found was I had to b- firstly build a completely separate library to just do eventing. And there's a oh, like thing. Lake U or Levent sounds familiar. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. So, um, but what I found was, um, so by having by having eventing be, if you, if we think about how it it presents, and this was another like mistake, and this is why I say I'm a bad engineer. I read the standard and I went eventing, great. I'm going to use that in my architecture. So. I build a stack of event services all the way down to my broker, um, thinking about what I want at the bottom of the stack there. You, what you've effectively got in in sort of the things that you've done already online is you've essentially got a dictionary at the bottom in the broker, which holds, and that's the in-memory version, right? Yep, yep. Okay, so the conclusion that I came to, and this is a really, um, it blew my mind when I figured it out, right? Uh-huh. And you've, An event subscription is just a funk. And what we're saying is some key execute this funk and give it some parameters, right? Yep. Okay. So 
the the mind-blowing piece was the funk can have a little bit of logic in it that says if configured to do so call something external like service bus else yeah. yeah call some internal stuff using service providers um and this is where the magic comes in in my eventing library which is what i did kind of differently to yours so i created something that i refer to as an event hub okay so all my brokers across the bottom of my stack that deal with eventing depend on an iEvent hub, which is just a, you know, an interface that I've exposed in my eventing library. At the application level, I just say, hey, add eventing. Um, and I can also make a separate call to say, hey, add, add distributed eventing if I want to. Um, so that's how I switch between local and remote, essentially. I just make it an extra call or I don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. What then happens in my um, my eventing code is essentially uh, that switch determines whether or not it's an internal or an external problem. And even when it's um, it would be in production an external problem, I can still step through the code as an internal problem. So this is one of the because key it's the things. same funk. You're yeah yeah yeah. Go ahead go ahead go ahead. Mm. Yeah yeah exactly. So and and here was a. This was a key thing that um, completely, uh, it, the headache for me was the way that the standard is implemented is an orchestration service that handles an event has a private method in it. And what essentially happens is you call listen to events um, and listen to events says, hey, uh, when this event is uh, uh, raised, essentially, call this private method. And I found a couple of things that I kind of didn't like about that. Okay. So the, the first one was it's a private method. Um, testing private methods is a pain in the ass. <laughs> you shouldn't. You should, yeah. test the, you should test the side effect of it though. Yeah. So the first thing I did was I said, okay, maybe they should be public methods. The second thing that I did was I said, okay, the notion of cul-de-sacs means that data flows one way and then it flows back the other way. And that's counterintuitive. What I wanted was akin to um, think of it like I've got a bucket of water and I'm pouring it over a waterfall and it goes the way it goes. So this is a key thing that I did differently to the standard. What I did was I made it so that data only flows one way. Nothing ever flows back up a cul-de-sac ever anywhere. Ah. Uh. Now, by doing this, what it meant was I had a whole bunch of orchestration services that had two dependencies. They had their T processing service and their T event processing service. And then if they handled any events, they had a third one for that, that particular kind of thing that they were handling. By, by making this change, I had a public method and I didn't need that third dependency. So now all over my stack, my dependencies start reducing. So you can just see from my screen share at the moment that between the top and the bottom, and you probably can't see it actually, um, because the top one is so far out of date that it doesn't actually have that reflected in it. Excellent. Oh yeah, it does, just indirectly. So what I was finding was, for example, here in mm -hmm. my, oh, excuse me, in my uh, in my master data, the way that I was diagramming this out, and it comes back to my point about how do you draw the problem? Um, I was finding that I was getting stuff like, no. I was finding I was getting stuff like this, where I have these these crossed lines, and it was really difficult to see kind of what was going on. Um, so by changing to my eventing, the way that I kind of do things now, um, if I look at the same portion of the diagram. Um, I've got this concept of uh, an events class, which is kind of a class of its own. It's not part of the standard. It's not documented anywhere. But think of this as a class that implements some interface that is like I handle events. Um, and then my eventing library can say, hey, find all things that handle events, call listen to events on them. And then when an event is received, they'll be the thing that will chain it down, essentially. So, so wait, wait, uh, come a little bit closer. So this system events, for instance, mm -hmm. this one and mm -hmm. company events and all that. Yeah. 
the best I can think of this is an, an exposure layer of some kind. Can you... Not quite. Okay, explain so, a little... Huh, go ahead. Mm -hmm. So it's not something that's publicly accessible. I can't call it directly from outside the app, but I can unit test it because obviously there's a, there's a class there, right? So I've got a thing in it that um, essentially what happens is the, the hub will instance these up. My event hub will instance these things up and it will give to that class, the service provider, and then the service provider will say, okay, I need services A through X. And for each one of those, I'm going to call it. Okay. So, so you are injecting it into your orchestration service? No. No. What happens is this constructs an orchestration service and calls the public method on it. Can I see what that looks like? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Uh, let me... The other screen, I think. I still have much cleaning up to do, so please don't upset me too much. No, no, I just want to see, like, I want to see the initial state of it. Yeah. You're up to something. I just want to know what it is. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm definitely not standard compliant, that I will tell you. Um, it's all right. I'm just looking for an idea. Go ahead. Yeah. I'm just trying to find the yeah. app. Okay, so, uh, yeah, cool. Let me, oh. oh Tip for me to pick the wrong window, right? Let me uh, zoom in on this. Okay, so at the moment, I've got a partial class that contains all my events. Big no-no, lots of dependencies. This is going to be split out into the things that are on the diagram. The diagram is actually yeah. ahead of my code base at the moment. But okay. imagine, imagine this was like... Um, uh, the company events thing on the diagram, okay? Or system events, that was the one that you pointed out. Oh, that's convenient. But, so I've got a listen to master data events here at the moment, um, but this would just be listen to, listen to events and it would listen to system events. And the way that it does that is effectively given a service provider and some data related to the event, um, what I'm gonna do is use the service provider to get the relevant services that I want and then handle the event. So I'm, I'm directly calling a public method that's part of the interface. So that straight away, it opens everything out. So now all of my event handling methods on it, all of my services are public, makes them really easy to test. Um, I do realize that this is a bit of a weird exception to um, rules in, in the sense that I've heard it said that if you inject service provider into anything, that's anti-pattern. I get it. I get it, right? But we've got a hook here where something has happened and I want to construct something to handle that and then handle it. And I want to do that in multiple different scenarios. And all I need is an instance of this class and I can literally just say, hey, handle this event by giving it the stuff that I want to give it from the hub. Make sense? So so let me see if I can process this. You are <laughs> in your internal event hub. <clears throat> you are listening to a particular event. That's system add, system delete. That's fine. The event does that. Yeah. And then you have this anonymous function that takes in a service provider and data. <clears throat> <clears throat> so whatever, whenever that event will be executed, it will offer the data and the service provider. And from the service provider, you're going to get, see, that's the thing that scares me the most is that <clears throat> it's like, <clears throat> it's like you're building a car. Uh -huh. And then inside that car, you have a piece that says, every time the tire blows, create a tire. Like have an entire <laughs> workshop that creates a tire for you from scratch. It's yeah, okay. You're on the side of the road. Your tire's blown. Construct a garage right here. Use that garage to fix the tire. That's <laughs> ta-da. <laughs> um, the, the reasoning for taking this approach is that it it opens up that possibility that I can. Daddy. Up in the living room. 
it opens up that possibility that. Can you help me do my tablet blue? I'll help you later, all right? Say hi to Hassan, look. Hi, Sam. You great, Ben? Hey, how are you? Say goodbye. Right, go on, back out in the living room. I'll be out in a minute, all right? Come on, because Daddy's busy. Just, just ten minutes. Just ten minutes. I'll, I'll let him go. <laughs> I can't just play with it. I need to play the B game. All right, I'll put it on in a minute. Out. Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> Girls. <laughs> go ahead, Paul. Go ahead. So, essentially, by by taking this approach, it it's a case of um, I've got a whole library. It exposes all these interfaces. How those events are raised is not something I'm aware of, right? So what I've got is some event has occurred. So I've got the data from the event. And in the event hub, I've got access to the service provider. That's the only thing that I really inject the, ser the, um, the service provider to. Don't inject it into anything else. So given that I've got that, when I'm handling events with the service provider and the blob of data that I've got, I can now handle the event. What it means is that when I come into scenarios like um, Azure Functions, um, I can I can literally just say, hey, given, given a service provider, I can construct a scope and I can pass the event message into the scope. And this is part of my reasoning for taking this approach. Basically, by passing the event message in there, the message contains the piece of data that's relevant to the event and, crucially, some security information about the user. So if you think about what happens in the context of a HTTP request, yeah. in a HTTP request, you have usually, say, an authentication header with a bearer token in it. And you use that to resolve, perhaps with a single sign-on library or something like that, who the current user is. And then once you've got the user ID, you can then use that to perform whatever business logic you want to perform, including doing security checks for, you know, um, authorization reasons, et cetera, et cetera. So the, the piece of authentication is done by single sign on the token. Once they're authenticated, I then have the separate task of authorizing them to do something. Yeah. So. What typically happens is during the HTTP request, the authentication information is available. As soon as I go into service bus, that's lost because I don't have anything like session state, request states, anything like that. The request is gone. So I've built my single sign-on library to be able to expose the pieces that my eventing library needs in order to get the current user ID from, from a single sign-on point of view and pass it into the message. What that means is then when I'm handling any kind of event, all I need is that message object and a service provider that has been configured to handle that message in some way by providing so, the relevant services. So, so Paul, hang on, just a quick question because I, I like I like some of that stuff. When you say get service, I B to B event handler, you have no idea what's behind that yeah. provider that imp aha uh -huh. so th this ib2b event handlers that should be the system events company events in the diagram but i haven't gotten that far yet so yeah there's pieces to this that i haven't quite finished um but this is a natural evolution of where i've been kind of going with eventing and i realized that you know this is way beyond anything like that the standard's doing um yep but for me, it was kind of like logical, natural progression over time. I had 10 different stages to get to this point. <laughs> and a lot of it boiled down to um, concepts that aren't discussed in the standard at the moment. So things like security, for example, they come up um, often as a regular headache. You know, even in, in the standard community on, on, on Discord, you, you know, people are always asking, oh, how did you solve the security problem? Well, this is how. Um, what it also means is that take the Functions Act, for example, think about how we want to secure our infrastructure in the cloud. Okay, So what you want is your public endpoint, which is going to be all of your OData controllers. Okay, That's all the stuff that can be called from the outside wor world. You then, in classic N-tier 
infrastructure style, you would then typically have the internal API, which is your Azure functions. So the way that I've deployed those is essentially you would have um, a VLAN within Azure and the Azure Functions app is connected to that with a private IP. It's not accessible to the outside world. So my application and my service bus can call the Azure function, but the rest of the world can't. So this adds an extra layer of security for us, but it also means that um, my attack service surface is now only my OData controllers, nothing else. And behind that is all my standard compliant cul-de-sacs that are handing things how you would expect to handle them. Does that make sense? <laughs> yeah. Um, how did this approach help with the security issue? Uh, so what I was finding was um, I, I ended up having to write two lots of code. Right? So I would write some code to say, for example, add an invoice to the system. And then I'd have like a CSV blob that would get, end up getting passed. And for each invoice that was generated from the, the blob, I needed to raise an event. And I'd go off and then I'd just call the add invoice thing that was on the orchestration service. Well, the first thing the add invoice method did was say, hey, who are you? Do you have access to perform this operation in this context? And it of course, would blow up because it was on the other side of a, a service bus event. So I didn't have access to the HTTP request. So that worked beautifully locally, of course. And as soon as I hit the cloud, everything fell apart. And I was like, what the hell's going on? And it boiled down to security. So I was like, okay, I've got to find a way to propagate what my backend in the web application already knows because it's already done the authentication piece. Um, so that in authorization calls in the, the, the stuff that's behind that, the second tier, um, that information is already propagated through. What it meant was that I could basically write half as much code. Right, right, right. So instead of having, um, you know, I've got a method for handling a, a, an import event and I've got a method for adding an invoice, I've just got a method for adding an invoice. So now the way I add an invoice is done once you know that i don't have duplicate code anywhere this is basically what it boils down to was mm -hmm. you know code rubs i was finding i had essentially two copies of my entire infrastructure i had one that was if you like security aware one that wasn't mm -hmm. and the net mm -hmm. result was that i was duplicating essentially a lot of lines of code but not only was i duplicating a lot of lines of code i was having to make lots of security assumptions that certain things could be trusted and certain things couldn't and and it just scared me a lot and i was like mm -hmm. no i don't like this so what i wanted to do was find a way to say okay between this pairing of applications between my tiers if you like my top tier is my api tier and my my second tier is my business logic tier that that does kind of intensive business logic operations yep um that stuff is secured in that it's not accessible to the outside world, but also mm -hmm. it expects to get information from service bus. So I don't have any functions, for example, that are HTTP requestable. They're only requestable from service bus. And again, you can't connect to the service bus from the internet. It's VLAN connected, it's, it's behind the firewall, it's completely contained in the cloud. So if you think about um, you know, big companies out there, tend to be suffering from the problem of why aren't you ISO compliant? Why aren't you PCI compliant? Why aren't mm -hmm. you, you know, when they're trying to get new clients, this sort of stuff is the stuff that security officers in potential customer companies or client companies, they look at this sort of stuff and they drool over it. So for me to be able to say, nah, we, we've got an API, it's in the cloud, you can talk to those endpoints, you can't talk to anything else, it's being pen tested by an external third party, it's being certified, and we don't allow anything to come outside of the firewall wall. <laughs> it's all internal. Go hit it as hard as you want. You know, send us a 1000 transactions, send us 10,000, we don't care. They'll just get queued up. <laughs> I get it. Look, there's one thing that I want to kind of, I'm, I'm interested to see if this is actually, if this approach is actually going to solve that problem. But as you may remember, I did talk a lot about there will be a new version of the standard where 
we take dependency injection to the completely new level where we basically have just islands islands every service is an island and what? they're sending messages to each other the way um the way the inventor of oop alan k and in, 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 in the way he envisioned it to be right because yeah. if you look you know how we say oop is supposedly a a reflection or or a model of um what the real world is that's what object-oriented programming is supposed to be hmm. paul we're not sitting symmetrically symmetrically like you and i just look at this communication that you and i are having right now you could be a foundation service the equivalent of someone who does something very basic and simple you could be the equivalent of an orchestration service i could be the equivalent of a broker or whatever and somehow we're still talking to each other the real world then and i'm going to take your screen here for a second the yeah. real world here doesn't really like the way we're architecting our systems doesn't really reflect or mirror the real world because we're we're making it simpler for our small brains to understand right but in in reality let me just let me just show you something this is going to blow your mind and kind of put a lot of people at doubt but that's their problem they're following me that's their fault so let's just go back here you follow a senior you get senior problems yeah you get, you get... <laughs> <laughs> that's it right there so Do you know I, I used to think you know when you were first talking about like freeing yourself from the request life cycle i thought great all my problems are going to go away no they just got <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's welcome true. to the standard look, look up to the standard right this is another problem so <laughs> so look the way we're structuring our systems right we basically go and do something like this and we basically go and do like this right this is this is me coming out of a a hell hole of you know existing patterns and existing architectures that need to have some rhyme or reason right yeah but here's what I realized. The real world is not like this, Paul. You know, the most complex system in the universe is not like this at all. It's more like this. The graph, if anything, right? And yeah. if you look, if you look at how the solar system is structured, for instance, right? Like you have these planets, they're going around the sun. You know, sorry for the flat earthers and the people that say Earth is the center or whatever. And, you know, around these, there are things that are going around that particular um, uh, orbit. Okay, let's forget about that for a second. So let's say this is Paul Wardy. This is Paul. And this is all the way down here in, in Washington. There is Hassan, right? And somehow we are able to communicate with each other and exchange information. Right. It is true, though, that we are not just directly communicating with each other. We're going through a medium and this medium is responsible for carrying our messages to one another. Is that correct? So if that's the case. This is going to take you in a whole new direction. I'm sorry, Paul. This, I, I know you're going to think about this for the rest of the night. and I know it's getting late over there, but just hear me out. Maybe we're approaching this whole system design thing in in a way that's still unnatural. Let me just tell you this. You have an entire universe around you. Gajillions of data streaming in high definition around the clock. And the universe never, ever had a glitch. It doesn't hiccup the way our systems do, right? It's just going. It keeps going and going and going. It doesn't overheat. It doesn't consume extra resources. It's still, it expands, but it's still the universe. Okay. Maybe the way we're designing these systems is just completely wrong, right? Maybe how systems communicate with each other is either by directly talking to each other or through some medium. So this Paul and Hassan example, I guess if I'm if you're here, like when I go talk to Kailu, I just talk to Kailu. So this is so this is a system where Hassan is basically talking to Kailu directly. So that's K right here. Someone is waving at you in the back. Look behind you. <laughs> 
All right. So, my man, you know, if this is how these systems are supposed to be sending messages to each other, what is this whole orchestration thing that we're doing? All right. Free beta deliveries. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> this this whole orchestration stuff that we're doing, right? Just think about this example for a second. Like, if I say this is here, what is this system that we're using? StreamYard. StreamYard. Hmm. Right. And the reason why we do this, because the distance between these two systems is so long, so we need a medium to communicate somehow. Are you, are you just thinking of the internet in general? Or are you thinking more? Any system in the universe. Any system. I am a system. You're a system. You're a biological system. I'm a biological system, right? When I pick up this cup in here, I have already started a communication with this cup to change its state from being on the table to being up in my hand. This is a system communicating with another system. It's funny you say that, actually, because <laughs> this is going to sound really weird. Mm -hmm. Um as per my experience with the standard and the way that I've kind of evolved it, what I wanted to do was, um, I haven't had the time yet, but I've been, I've been putting some thoughts down, basically just randomly scratching some down in, you know, notepad or whatever. And I've been collecting them up in a series of documents. Um, but I had this idea that this whole act of, um, building systems from scratch and the bare bones, basic stuff that people fight with, you know, crud functionality mm -hmm. all day, every day. It's nothing. It's, it's primitive. It's nothing. It, it's archaic. Like why are developers still wasting their time with that crap, frankly? So, um, it got me thinking that, um, once you've got an underlying sort of architecture, so think of this as like the standard model, right? Once, once you've got weird, right? The standard mm -hmm. model, the the you know the standard model in physics tells us, hey, we've got some basic elementary particles. When they come together, they make atoms, and when the atoms come together, they make you know um, molecules. And when they come together, we can build things like DNA. And then we get into biology territory and blah blah blah. And I think this is kind of where you're going with it, right? Is mm -hmm. the, the fundamentals are pretty basic. So. Um, the idea that I've kind of had in mind is I want to put a wrapper around the standard and I want to say, hey, hey, for the basics, for the fundamentals, I want to see AI just generate that crap. If I want to then build the next tier up, more complex stuff, this interconnected stuff that really matters, the things that businesses really care about, I can then consult with that same AI model. And I yep. can say, hey, you see these systems over here and over here and over here, connect them all together, apply these business rules, make it all happen. And then yep. it builds me a new system. Yep. Rinse, repeat. And yep. then you start to build that, that structure. And then over time, if, if you're doing that at scale with lots of systems, new systems coming up here, there and everywhere, you end up with that more fluid, natural, like it happens in the real world, right? It's just a massive pool of elementary particles that are all just interacting with one another mm -hmm. we don't think of it in terms of trees at that scale but at the at the bit at the most fundamental level level the way that we view the fundamental particles in the standard model is that you know there's this sets of them small sets that are interconnected so you can think of that as kind of like you know you've got a parent with two children yep right so that's the stuff we're building at the moment yep but it's it's that connecting lots of parents with two children and yep. so on. Um, and yeah, the, the, the thing is, this this one child that is that has one parent also yeah. has five teachers, and yeah. has five friends, and have five neighbors, and have maybe two mentors. So <laughs> what I'm what I'm saying is this style here. This is what the standard is promoting. That's the standard 2.0, starting yeah. from that moment onwards. It's basically saying, no, create very solid pipelines. It's like we're basically building railroads. But I, I think that's right at that scale. Because if, then if you think about that leftmost node as like the exposure point, yep. then beyond that is where you have the web. That's right. That, that's where you have the graph of interconnected things. But behind yep. that, you have this nice, neat, tidy structure. Yes. <laughs> yes, I understand. 
what I'm trying to say is this and this structure scales. That's the beauty of it. It scales like crazy, right? But there's still something missing there because especially they you know how I know this. Every time we have to do a pass through, every time you do a pass through service, just because you want to balance your architecture, you know that there's something missing there, right? We all know that it's obvious, right? The, what I'm just trying to tell you is releasing the standard 3.0 it needs to have something major that influences the way we visualize our problems in the first place. Like, let me ask you this, Paul. If I were to tell you create a calculator hmm. and you don't have to think about anything in building this calculator other than just creating a function here that does add a component that does add and a component that does subtract another component that does, you know, div division, divide, division like this, just components. Hmm. Then let's say you want to build a component that does the switch. So based on the incoming input, it will go and communicate with the proper uh, island or the proper component to basically execute that switch. So it's basically sending messages. It doesn't know on the other side who's really sending these messages. Uh, the receiver doesn't know, like they're not, hyper connected to each other it's just sending messages to some island right and then let's say you have a if if you look if you just look at how the structure in nature of atoms cells stuff like that let's just say that this is your input this is your ui let's just say this is your ui and your ui is basically sending a message out there to say, I have an operation who handles operation, whoever is handling operations, go take care of this. So imagine this view here. The scary part about this view though, is that imagine this view multiplied in a complex system. Like you're basically this view in and of itself, just alone like that, basically gets rid of all the pass through functions. So it doesn't really matter whether this is a foundation or this is an orchestration or whatever. They don't have to play by these rules anymore. All they know is that they receive a certain you type do, of messages. Uh, go, ahead, you, go ahead. Yeah, sorry to cut you off. Go, go ahead. You, you do have to. Um, you do have to bear in mind that there's there's a bit of history around this, right? Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. for example, going back to a time when I used to work for the local council, um, they had exactly this. They had all these different. Um, they, in fact, it was a running joke from the head of IT, actually. He used to refer to them as silos and uh -huh. Uh -huh. all the councillors and all the, the, the heads of all the departments referred to them as silos. And it was essentially, imagine you had, you know, in a local council, you've got like a planning department and then you've got like a council tax department and then you've got a department that deals with waste and then you've got a department that customer services is a different department for some reason mm -hmm. yeah, you've got all these different departments but when i as a consumer want to interact with my local council i don't care what department handles it i just want to go to some council and i want to say here's my question deal with my problem correct and um so while i was working there i found that it was exactly this they had this soup they had just all these different things. And what would happen is a call would come in, say, for example, or somebody would walk into reception, say, oh, I've got problem X. And they go, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me go and pin that person down for you. You know, and then you get transferred about 60 mm -hmm. different times to, you know, various people. And eventually you'd <laughs> end up with the right person. Going through the graph there. until you hit the right. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh -huh. And, and it, to my mind, like building systems like that, you did eventually get there, but it was frustrating for, for yeah. you as a consumer you know yeah it's it's, so, it's not optimum mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah so what ended up happening was they employed me to build them a biz talk instance where i took all of those silos connected them all up to biz talk and then i provide a unified uh local search for everything the council did mm -hmm. so you could just type in someone's name or an address and it would go yeah here it all is from all the different departments yeah, yeah. right what do you want to know and this was great from a customer services point of view because whatever the question was 
The information was just there. They had it to hand. And to my mind, so this, this is kind of like how I look at application architectures these days. It's like I accept the real world is messy. There's mm -hmm. this soup of stuff that goes on, right? Yep. But what consumers want is organized mess. Yep. They want to be able to just go to a thing which loosely, like, I know where the council building is. I know what the council's phone number is. But I don't know beyond that who I need yep. to speak to, right? Yep. So it's it's that problem. It's like there should be a place I can go, no matter what my question is, I can get it answered. Now, in modern times, it seems like the way that that's going is if you look at the current generation and how things work, if I want to know anything about anything, I would do a Google search, right? Yep, yep that's true. Mm -hmm. That's going to point me in the right direction. Yep. Um, and let's say it's like, I want to speak to my local council, right? So I do uh -huh. a Google search and they go, here's the number, here's the address. You can either turn up there or you can call them between these times, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I, I don't know, let's say I opt to call them, you know. So step one is I have found the right business to speak to. Uh -huh. Step uh -huh. two is then finding the person within the business. And it's the same with microservice and, and software architectures. Step one, you call the endpoint. Step two, um, service provider kicks in and says, ah, I know what, what needs to handle that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> or mm -hmm. some routing portion in, in the case of ASP.NET takes place, which then asks the service provider to construct the right thing. Yep. Call it. Yep. Um, and then down the chain, it gets handled, right? Yep. And it, it's this concept of there should be structure, but on top of the structure, there should be this thing that, it doesn't matter what your problem is. I can just go to the thing and I can just say, solve my problem. Yep. yep. <laughs> and I feel like the way that that's going is with stuff like the advancements that like the likes of OpenAI are making with, you know, large language models and stuff like that. I'd love to build a system which is kind of like, ask me a question and I'll solve it for you. Let, let me just ask you this. Imagine, Paul, imagine if every single service you'll ever build no matter how complex the work it's doing is looks like this just imagine there's public class student coordination service okay just a very simple class like that and then private read only i messenger okay so far so good right and literally every one of these services all that it's doing it doesn't know like when you send a, a mail to 11 11 56 street new york city right you don't really know who lives there you don't know much about the destination other than that you want to send the message in that direction because you want something to be done Today, services know way too much about each other, even in the age of dependency injection. Just hear me out. You know, let's just say you have your constructor in here. So I'll just. This is the approach I took with my um, my messaging, my um, uh, eventing, sorry. Eventing? Okay. Yeah. I basically went, look, I'm going to raise an event and the hub is going to figure out from a configured service provider what needs to be called. I don't care what it is. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's that's fair. Just Just hear me out. Imagine, yeah. just imagine, back to the tri-nature theory, right? So every service out there, and this is just the standard 3.0 forming in my head. Imagine if every single service has a an input and a listener, like it, it, it does processing and a listener and an output. So basically what it's doing is that it says in the constructor area in here, public student coordination service, you're basically saying this is iMessenger like that. Let me zoom out a little bit here. And then what it's really doing is that it's going and saying, this is this dot messenger equal messenger. And then in here, you're basically saying, listen to messages for and you're basically defining an event in here like some student 
coordination. Yeah, and so this is how I am. I, I interpreted the standard is set up. Is essentially you've got this, um, you've got this thing that you're subscribing to. Mm -hmm. Whereas what I did was I, I sort of turned that on its head. I said I've got a thing that can handle a message, mm -hmm. and then I've got something else which will figure out what messages I handle. Hang on, I need to make this a little bit more. So messenger dot listen to messages for and it's basically saying here is a list of my events that i'm listening for here's all the things that i will listen to and then in here basically um uh, funk process a uh, student sync and you're just passing this so so listen to this you can individually make your own call but what this service is doing is that it's listening to whoever sends messages to this address so there is no interfaces anymore there is no interface this is the equivalent of me saying 50 50 street new york city all right so this service is saying oh now i live at this address so is, is i messenger like it's kind of like service provider in this case or some cross between that and uh no it's an event hub that encapsulates uh, any kind of event that might happen but where, where do they come from it doesn't matter like it's outside of the concern of this service yeah. you know what i mean like or, or do you mean technically where they come from so I, I'm thinking about it in terms of like, um, so if you think about the architecture that I've got at the moment, right? When I raise an event, I don't care who or what is going to handle it. I'm just saying, hey, this thing happened. Go, mm -hmm. go deal with it, right? So what I've then done in my eventing library is I've said, okay, I've got this concept of a hub that behind that has a standard compliance stack somewhat. Right that um in there it basically says okay um what subscriptions have i got and from the subscriptions that i've got they tell me either where to send that message or um something locally that um can handle that message so it's either something remote that i can send to that's, or something that's, internal that i see can send see this to. this is why you're my brother you're sending the message and you couldn't care less whether this message is going to be um, internal or external. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't matter, and it shouldn't matter. Okay. Yeah. Um, that, that that was exactly what 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 bugged me about the way that eventing is in in the current architecture was like. To my mind, it felt that I had like an orchestration service, and the orchestration service had to depend on the specific thing that it was going to handle. Whereas actually it, it felt more fluid for me to say, look, if you want to send me a thing, uh, you know, a message, I'll handle it because the, this is my interface, right? Mm -hmm. But you don't have to, that's somebody else's problem to figure out what sends me messages. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. I, I separated the two out. Whereas it feels like with, with an approach where you put the subscription into, um, a service that can handle it you're saying mm -hmm. i am explicitly interested in handling these things because i have this implementation whereas what i did was i said i have an implementation and something else is going to something else needs to decide ah uh... yeah i i kept the two things separately because then what that meant was at the application level when i'm building out the app i've got all these pieces and then all i needed to do was play lego <sighs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I see what you're doing. So you're basically saying my service should be independent of its communications. However, it's being it's going to be used. It's completely yeah. irrelevant. It could yeah. be used in an event. It could be used directly. It could be. I like exactly. that. I like that approach. You're basically saying I am out there publicly. So, yeah, think of it like you've got um, a student foundation service, right? So you've got mm -hmm. CRUD exposed for students. Okay. And 
sat on top of that, we have, um, let's ignore processing for now. You've got an mm -hmm. orchestration service and it has that, that foundation service. And then it has a student event foundation service as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what's going to happen is a call is going to come in. It's going to call the, the foundation service to go, I don't know, put it in the database, update it, delete it, whatever it's going to do. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to raise an event. Mm -hmm. Okay. And imagine I'm doing this at scale. So mm -hmm. replace student with literally anything. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is the base premise on how I build my architecture. Because so I basically said, right, that's the core thing of what I've got. Now, now that I've raised my events, I've passed that off to some separate library. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. So it's it's not even in the same library. It's a completely external thing. Okay. Right, right. So what what then happens is at the application level, when I'm putting the pieces together, I'm saying, okay, I want an app that can solve problems with putting students on courses. Okay, so the way that I'll do that is I'll, whenever I receive a new student, I'll give it to a student orchestration service. Whenever mm. I receive a new class, I'll give it to a, do you see what I mean? Yeah, I see what you mean. And so what I've then done is I've separated the concern of subscribing to events from the things that can potentially handle the events. And it gives me that optionality in how I handle the events. So mm -hmm. in the case of my code base, I've got a thing that can handle adding an invoice in my back end because it's part of my B2B library. Locally, right. I'm just going to call it. In the cloud, I'm not going to call it. I'm going to farm it off to another app over service bus, and that's going to call it. But it's the okay. same library. It's literally the same code. Right, right. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And and the fact that you know it's the same implementation is somewhat irrelevant. I can have so the the next stage that I was kind of looking at was separating out the interfaces um, mm -hmm. and putting potentially the interfaces into their own assembly, um, mm -hmm. separate to the implementations. Because then what I can do is I can say, okay, here's my public API. This is what it looks like. Here are all my models, and here are my interfaces in an assembly. If you want to call my stuff, this is what it looks like. This is your metadata. You can share mm -hmm. that freely. You don't have to give away anything that's internal or secret because it's just it's empty DTOs for the best you know way yeah. of explaining it, and it's and it's descriptions of what things can be called, right? It, yeah, and it, hmm, it looks like the. Um... I'm, I'm assuming that the you're just you're just you're just letting the it's just a little it could be a little bit less flexible if you know what i mean because you're letting the replication happen sorry the orchestration happen hmm. in one place like one node holds all the orchestration pieces if you give control to the thing that handles the event of mm -hmm of the subscription then you remove some flexibility that was the conclusion that i came why to. why you you have a you have a thing you have a cup and yep. this cup is capable in, uh, capable capable of handling any kind of liquid yeah so you say i've got a liquid and then you go okay i need a cup service right um but in your case what you're doing is you're saying hey i'm a cup service give me that liquid Whereas what I'm saying is, okay, I'm going to pick one of many cup services that I want to give this particular liquid to. Yeah. Because, you know, if it's liquid nitrogen, I might want to put it in a flask rather than a cup. Mm -hmm. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So that separation is, well, this is why we refer to it as inversion of control, right? When we're talking about dependency injection. Yeah. As much as possible, what you want in your implementation is you want to say, here's the raw logic that allows me to perform a business operation. Mm -hmm. But separate from that, I'm going to have something else which is going to decide when that logic gets called, because that is a completely different concern. Mm -hmm. So this is where we start to talk about solid principles when we're talking about single responsibility in particular. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To my mm -hmm. mind, it felt that the act of subscribing to an event was a different responsibility from the act of handling an event. Do you see what I mean? Yeah, yeah. And 
I know that we, we could probably go round and round in circles on this all day. And I'm sure there's probably about a thousand developers out there right now that will probably like, they'll watch this and they'll be like, what the hell are you on? But to my mind, like <laughs> the, the way that I was kind of looking at it was the more um, that, that concept of responsibility that no one can ever define my internal monologue definition of that is it's the smallest possible thing that you can define. Once you get to that point, you've successfully broken everything down to the nth degree and therefore mm -hmm. it cannot be broken down any further. Mm -hmm. And if you've reached that point, you've probably modularized your code base well enough that it's flexible enough that you can break any problem down, no matter how complex it is. Yeah. Yeah. And what I found is like just simple things, CSV files, for example, they still gripe me because it's a batch. That's not one thing. That's mm -hmm. many things I need to do. Mm -hmm. And I need, I need to perform an operation at the batch scale that decides which slices of that. If you, if you imagine that invoices can have multiple lines, I've got a CSV file. If I've got a two line invoice, I've got two lines in that file that I need to process as a single transaction. So there's, it's, it's two lines in the file, but it's one invoice. Wait, Paul, when you send mail, you don't just put the mail out there and you let the mailbox determine who better uh, deserves your mail. You, the sender, determine who would receive it. Yeah. But in the case of our software, it doesn't work like that. How come? Every service has a purpose. Um, because... It could be a sub purpose, wait, but every wait. service has a purpose. Yeah, absolutely. But like, so the way to look at it is think of um, the person as being the application and the application saying, hey, I have a whole office full of tools available to me. I'm going to pick which tools I use to handle which problems. Right. I have. The, the person is a component and the tool is another component and the person is sending the message to the component. Yeah, but if you think of the service as the tool, the tool doesn't decide which... If I have a hammer, it doesn't decide which nails it hits. No, no. I, I do. <laughs> no, just wait. No, 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 no. That's not how the universe works. I'm 100%. Don't think of anything out there other than it being a service. Everything is a service. Everything okay. is a system. Yeah. Every system has a purpose. Yeah. And Due to that purpose, then you have that chain reaction of a trigger that makes every system tries to go and fulfill its own purpose. And in order for that to happen, it sends messages to other services and other systems that have their own purposes. Mm -hmm. If you think about it this way, then it's not, you're not an application, you're a system and the tool that you're picking is another system and you are communicating with that tool the message that you're sending to that tool is by physically picking it up. So the way that I've kind of looked at it is, say I make furniture for a living. Someone places an order with me. I give them back a table. In the process of doing that, that person that placed an order with me doesn't care how it gets achieved. Mm -hmm. They're not specifically saying you must use this hammer. That's right. They you, you must use message. these materials. That's you must true. use this piece of wood. That's yeah. true. Okay. So they're sending a message saying, Hey, give me a table. And I'm saying, right. yeah, here's a table in response. Right. Yeah. Okay. So if you think about it at that level, the services that I'm implementing is imagine I'm implementing a carpenter service. Mm -hmm. the, the public endpoint that I expose is, yes, send me requests for tables. Yeah? Mm -hmm. I'm listening. It, so it's it's not, okay, send me a, um, a, a bill of materials and a bunch of tools, and I will put those together. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Mm -hmm. If you think about yourself and the tools as two different beings, then yes. Yeah. Because now you become an orchestrator of some kind. Yeah, I was so thinking of kind of like me in the colloquial sense of the the endpoint, the service that's exposed. Right. So 
when when we communicate you ask me to do a job i do the job and i say here it is and i give you some result yeah but but, but also understand like the assumption also is that every system has a dependency purpose and exposure so even uh, this hammer yeah. like like this cup here that i'm holding it has an exposure layer it's this handle that's an exposure layer because that's how i'm communicating with that cup right, right. it has a purpose to fill in liquid in it yeah. but it also has a dependency which is the structure that's holding it together that's its dependencies in its own way someone yeah. might say it could be a dead end service sure whatever you want to do right i am a system and this is a system mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? You, hmm. I think, okay, it's, it comes down to this philosoph philosophical view, right? And we are an hour and a half in, so I have to wrap up. But can we, can we continue that discussion? Because I'd like to, I really want to break into the standard 3.0. And I think you are the precursor to that. <laughs> I do have a habit of causing conflicts. Confusion, whatever. <laughs> Let let's yes. see how far we can take this. Ping me again sometime this week or the next, and let's and let's keep this discussion going because I really want to push the standard three point zero out. And what what are you thinking the the standard is lacking at the moment? It's still so the standard still. I can't just bring someone from the street who doesn't know anything about anything. And all of the sudden, they, they understand systems design and architecture. Uh, so there's wrong. still this there's still this wall. Go ahead. Wrong. And I'm living okay. proof of that. OK. OK. So the, the reasoning is, um, so take Ash, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, he's He now works with me. Mm -hmm. um, I took him from another company mm -hmm. coding in another language. Mm -hmm. And I said, hey, here's the standard. Get your head around it. Yep. He he got his head around it. He asked me a ton of questions. And I went, Great, what do you think? He went, Can I have a job? Uh -huh. And now and now he's working with me. So that's completely different skill set in a completely So the standard is it is simple. Chain. Yeah. I guess and, the the other thing that I want to do with the standard is that uh, the flexibility. Like if I tell you today, hey, instead of you let's say you have an orchestration service, right? Mm -hmm. And this orchestration service is supposed to register a student, right? Yeah. But instead of you calling a foundation service, you have to call an orchestration service, which changes your architecture completely. Huh? And That's the standard, <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like if you just hear me out on this, because this is really the, the gist of it. If I go here and tell you, hey, here is your architecture, I think I hit exactly that problem somewhere. Let me... I know you did. I know you did for sure. Look, 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 look at this ball. You have a storage broker, right? And you have a service, right? And this service, you have another orchestration service sitting up in here. And this, this is an orchestration service. And this is a foundation service. Are you with me? So check this out, my friend. Mm -hmm. If I come to you today and tell you, here, this is a broker. If I tell you today, have this orchestration service actually to register a student, call a another orchestration service. How much change would that be? Oh, foundationally speaking, it, it's a complete contradiction of everything in the standard. Um, right. So you however, would end up doing what? You would end up creating a coordination service. However, this is how mm -hmm. I solved it. So what mm -hmm. I did was, um, mm -hmm. uh, so I, I found a problem in, I was receiving a CSV blob and I needed to call an orchestration service that from the orchestration service that received the CSV blob mm -hmm. um, that, would, that would specialize in the parsing function. Right. Okay. Uh, it's not something I want to do on an event it's a trivial enough task to effectively do a smart string dot split some extra bits of logic in there. Yeah. Um, I have an external, um, 
I've got what I call data lib, which is an external library that contains the basic function of CSV parsing, but wrapped, wrapped around that, because these were specifically transaction CSV lines, I didn't want to just parse and return, say, like an anonymous object. I wanted to specifically return transaction CSV line objects. Does that make okay, sense? Okay, what, what did you do? So this is what I did. Um, I took my transaction CSV line service, I built a new CSV data parser broker. And behind that, I put my orchestration services and they depend on a processing service and that's a dead end service. Now, technically- Wait, wait, the broker is calling the orchestration service? Yes, but it's an orchestration service that lives in another library. And the reason for ah, that is that ah, ah, I haven't ah. built an exposure point for it. Okay. I really should have built like a, a CSV parser. The main reason for wanting to do this was I wanted all of my uh, B2B stuff in my B2B assembly. Mm -hmm. So those orchestration services actually live in the same assembly, but the parser processing service doesn't. It lives somewhere else. Right. So this is where we hit um, this strange thing where I don't know where it fits in the standard or even if it is legitimate in the standard at all. So I kind of looked at that and went, it's somewhat acceptable because that's a it's a utility broker that I'm passing into my orchestration service, but it's performing some complex business logic to some degree. Yeah, going with subsystems still, that doesn't solve that problem that I was telling you about. But so what's uh, your what's your problem of an orchestration causing calling an orchestration? Can you think of a scenario where that would happen legitimately? Yeah, yeah if you decide, you know, legitimately, I'll tell you, like if you have Let's say you're, you're at this level and now all of a sudden someone is saying, hey, we need to be able to also send notifications every time uh, an event like that happens. You have two options. If you're already overloaded like this, you're going to do. You're going to go and do this. You're going to scale like crazy like that in order for you to be able to support more functionality. And now how I would handle it. How would you do it? How would you do it? So I would call call my business operation service, my regular uh -huh. foundation to do the operation. Uh -huh. And then I would call my event foundation service that would call the broker. And then I would, when I handle the event, I can handle it however I want to in as many services as I want to. Right. So you're basically just, you know, selling me on the cul-de-sac, right? The event, you're firing an event and something else. But how much change would that be from this simple structure that you have here today? Uh, so what I would have is alongside that, I'd have another orchestration service that would depend on another foundation service that would deal with notifications. Right, then, but you don't have that today. But more than one thing could do that. That's why I already have that. Yeah, but, but hear me out. Like, let's say you have another orchestration service that does that, right? Yeah. So that means you're either going to have to go cul-de-sac, just go from behind like this, or you're going to have to throw a coordination service at the top. No. Uh, no, because the, again, the the way that I do my eventing is instead of going down and then coming back up. Mm -hmm. In the way you're, that you you're staying kind, at the top. Got it. I I raise the event, and then it disappears off the stack, and then the event hub says, "Hey, a thing happened. Right, what's going to handle that?" And it comes down the stack again, but a different path. If, right. If you think about it, like um, at the application level, imagine I've got app. And then underneath the app, I've got um, or service provider, right? And then underneath that, I've got a whole list, long list of orchestration services. And what happens is app or service provider receives something. And then it says, OK, there's a big routing table, essentially, via the event subscription model that's been set up in the event hub. And it basically says, OK, what's going to handle this? What are the rules that have been set up at that level? And then it just pours them in. Make sense? Yeah. So everything's a waterfall for me. I just trickle everything down. I never go. It, so in your model, you would go left to right, and then you would go right to left mm -hmm. to come back up into another orchestration service, yep. then then down a different path, yep. right? Yep. Whereas what I do is I go left to right, and then I go out into my um, hub, out into the sphere somewhere, mm. right? 
mm -hmm. service provider, then I go left to right again. But how do you test that? Um, because every piece of that chain is tested. No, no. How do you test the orchestration piece of it? Because now your hub is doing orchestration. Uh, well, my event library is separate, standard compliant, and it is fully unit tested. So the library is sitting on top between your exposure layer and your service layer. Uh, so my, my exposure layer is controllers, right? Yes. So I've got MVC controllers. Yep. And then the MVC controllers have injected into them uh, an orchestration service. So that's the right. entry point, okay? And then at the bottom of the stack, uh, after that orchestration, there will ultimately be an event broker that will call into the event hub that allows me to trigger another portion from another cul-de-sac. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah. And I'm doing it through the service provider. So like with the way that you've got um, eventing documented at the moment, um, you've got singletons that handle yep. your events. And yep. this was part of the security problem that I had. Yep. Right? If yep. you've got a singleton, you can't have users. Who's, who's really the owner. Yeah. Yeah. So by, by using the service provider in the hub, I can in request scope or in event scope, instance a thing that scopes specifically to that user's uh, context and then i can say hey within this scope um i showed you the uh, code for that didn't i the... here yeah. i create a scope for my event and i pass the event message into it so now i've got a service provider rule that in that scope can provide the message of type t you mm -hmm. know whatever mm -hmm. t happens to be um, and I've got my um, user information. So now I can say, hey, my scoped service provider, give me the thing that's potentially going to handle this event. Yep. Give me some handler. Now, this isn't really the handler. This is the, the thing that's going to route to the correct services, essentially. Think of yep. this as being the equivalent in my code to what happens when you do um, adding an OData model or adding um, an MVC route into yep. your root tables. I'm basically saying, hey, here's a thing that's registered to handle a set of roots. Yeah. Go and go and get that thing and then tell it to handle that event. And I don't care what it is or how it works. And that that in turn may depend on uh, an external event hub so it can send it off somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So all my eventing always happens internally first, but then optionally externally. Let's revisit that part. Yeah. And, you know, hopefully next time you and I sync up, hopefully soon. It needs cleaning, definitely. I, I would have, yeah, I, I would have a more fully formed ideas around the next iteration of the standard. It'll definitely be a breaking change, but I appreciate the time, sir. Thank you for hanging out. And, uh, you know, people watching, you know, Paul Wardy is, is if, if you haven't, you know, for the 7,000 people that came after the last time Paul Wardy went on a podcast with me, uh, he's also a member of our standard community. And as you may have noticed, he can go with thoughts and think about the future of software engineering, modern engineering, um, you know, the, the kind of people that actually are boots on the ground, not just, you know, sitting in a big ivory tower writing theories and not implementing any of it, you know. So uh, thank you, Paul, for joining me today. Go. Go hang out with your kids and I'll talk to you later. Thank you, brother. Take care.